Good evening, all. Welcome to Fair uh, Conversations That Count. Thank you for joining us. I am Sri Lekha Pale, Fairfax GOP Vice Chair of Strategy and Engagement. Our goal through this program, Conversations That Count, is to bring in guests that can address challenges facing all our communities, provide solutions, and inspire change. This evening, I'm excited to invite one such women leader during Women's History Month who can inspire change. She is Victoria Cobb. Victoria is the president of Family Foundation of Virginia. It is the largest and oldest pro-family advocacy organization in Virginia, where she maintains the vision, mission, and strategies of the organization. In her 17th year as president, she now also oversees the work of their legal arm, the Founding Freedom Law Center. Victoria is also the president of Family Foundation Action. It is a 501c4 that protects families and promotes responsible citizenship by giving Virginians the tools they need to hold their elected officials accountable, including educating and mobilizing voters in key elections. In her role as a spokesperson for this great organization, she is quoted multiple times in the media. Her weekly commentary on the issues of the day can be heard on Speak Up Radio. She currently serves on the board of directors for John Jay Institute and Family Policy Alliance. Victoria, we are honored to have you. Welcome to Conversations That Count. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Excellent, Victoria. I can see the energy in your, in your <laughs> voice. I love that. Victoria, tell us, I mean, you're a very accomplished lady. It is our honor to have you during Women's History Month. Tell us the mission about the mission and vision and the core principles of the organization that you're running. Yeah, um, at the Family Foundation, our mission is very simply that we want to preserve and promote the family in Virginia because we believe it's God's foundation upon which a free and thriving society is built. And so um, everything we do gets back to that core fundamental mission. Um, we really want to see a commonwealth of strong families that are guided by faith, that are protected by a principled government. So um, everything we do kind of connects to all of that. We do have um, essentially these core principles and, you know, it'd be lengthy for me to go into all of them, but basically um, there are things like human life, that it's sacred from conception until natural death. And so that's how we get into issues like abortion or end of life. Um, we have principles on marriage as a lifelong union between one man and one woman. And that's how we get into things around divorce reform or even the definition of marriage. Um, religious liberty is another big one. So we can talk about all these as we go on tonight, but um, our goal is simply to um, really get to a Virginia where families are thriving and they're thriving because we've set up a good public policy culture around them, that the laws actually further a healthy family rather than kind of step in between parents and children or, um, you know, the raising of your family. So yeah, in a nutshell. Uh, Victoria, that's kind of a unique, um, uh, I mean, it, family values are so very important to everyone, but I just don't think there is any other organization, correct me if I'm wrong, in Virginia, that kind of holds so true to the values and the core principles. So how do you strategize to ensure this, all these core principles reach all section of people within Commonwealth and also the government section? How do you strategize and make that happen? Yeah, I mean, we... Our, our core functions span a lot of different things. So it's probably best for me to kind of explain those core functions um, and that'll help kind of answer the question. A lot of what we're known for, what we do is advocacy at the state government level, as you mentioned. Um, and so a lot of it is looking at what our General Assembly gets given in their um, really several thousand bills every year and helping them, you know, they can hardly go through that material and understand all those bills in 45 or 60 days. And so we look at those and we say, what impacts the family? And sometimes we bring to a legislator to carry a bill that says, how do we promote the family in this piece of legislation? So that's one key function. We actually also do this at the local level and school boards. That's been kind of a hot thing this past year is a lot of parent activity in school boards. We're very much involved with all of that and kind of driving some of that. And so we're connecting 
with people right there at their local level, really with the decisions that affect their family the most, which happen right there in the school day, right there in the, their locality. Um, and then we do other things like we work through the, the judicial system. We'll talk about the law center, I'm sure at some point, but we've opened a law center here. And that's the goal is that sometimes these matters end up having to be played out in court. Sometimes um, it's not enough to battle the general assembly or battle in the school board, but our families are actually being attacked through bad laws and they, they need to be overturned actually with the, the courts. And so um, we have just a lot of different functions and our goal is simply to connect with the real needs and real concerns of families and, and really work through the process to help strengthen them. So Victoria, as we further the conversation, on a side note, I need to ask you, where do you get the energy from? You are so <laughs> <laughs> I have never been accused of not having energy or passion. I think that's just a God-given part of my personality. Occasionally, it comes out too fast and too much, but it's rarely, um, you know, it's never, nobody's ever said, you should really, you know, um, try to perk up a little. And, and, and no surprise, I have four children, and I, I have friends who say, things like, you know, their child's really shy or kind of more like a, a wallflower personality. And I'm like, we have four and none of them are like that because they have my genetics. And so, you know, it's just, I think it's just a genetic thing, but you know, when you love what you do, when you feel passionate about what you do, it, it you know, it gives you a lot of energy. <laughs> Well, Victoria, I'm a healthcare professional. I love what I do. Yeah. And on, on any given day, I'll get up, uh, get up and want to go to work. I don't think there's any day where I want to sleep in because I don't <laughs> want to go to work. I love taking care of patients. So, uh, and Victoria, you earned your BA in political science and leadership studies at uh -huh. University. Of How did you get into this line of business? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm a person of faith, so I'm I'm from a Christian background, and I really believe that I had a call towards the life issue. That was the issue that God just put a burden for the injustice of the unborn and the situation with abortion on my heart at a really young age. Um, this actually came out early. I was in a, a Christian um, K-12 school, and so we would actually talk about these issues. And so I actually had a passion for life um, before I even left high school. And so that drove me into thinking, what do you do to affect abortion? And I figured in my head, I thought you become a judge because of course, Roe versus Wade is the prevailing issue. You know, that's sort of the, the, the thing that has to be overcome to really provide ultimate justice for the unborn. So I kind of thought, okay, you head in the direction of political science. Um, but interestingly enough, um, I, I ended up at the University of Richmond. They had a leadership school. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. I didn't know I would run a nonprofit. Leadership is about the best major I could have had for the job that I'm now doing. But I didn't know that, obviously. But it was just a really interesting study to me on, on how to lead organizations and change. And I knew I wanted to lead change because that was you know, what, what I was passionate about. So all of it just kind of came together. And I quickly realized I don't have to be a judge to impact abortion, that all the laws that affect abortion, yes, we do need Roe overturned if we ultimately um, believe that human life is sacred from conception on, but um, the laws around that are actually made at the state level and there's really a role for advocacy. There's really a role for um, affecting change within the legislature. So I ended up not really heading in that law school route. I did the poli sci and, and, and leadership and that actually ended up being perfect for what I do now. So God knew what he was doing when he was putting these passions on my heart. <laughs> I always say God is great. He knows it all. <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, Victoria, I mean, I know you just talked about the belief that human life from fertilization to na natural death is sacred, and also the right to life is foundation to all other rights. I truly yeah. believe that as well. So what does the Family Foundation do to support the women who find themselves wrestling with an un unexpected pregnancy? I always say it's life, things happen. So what, what, what does the Family Foundation do to support those mothers? Yeah, so there's two sides of the pro-life issue. There's one is the legal side, which is there are laws that impact abortion. And the other is the culture side, which is that people have real human need around unplanned pregnancy. And so every group doesn't need to do both, but we need to be deeply connected. And so at the Family Foundation, what we mostly do is in the public policy space. But as we all look at right now, we're sitting in the United States with a decision of Dobbs at the US Supreme Court that in June, we could have a decision that overturns Roe. All that's going to do is change the legal landscape. That doesn't change the heart and mind. That doesn't affect the real situations of women. And so what we try to do is really 
do our job to connect to, uh, in Virginia in particular, we have wonderful, wonderful organizations, pregnancy resource centers that are absolutely doing the job of coming alongside women because women don't have abortion because they think that's their number one best solution. They usually have an abortion because they don't feel they have the financial, emotional, whatever the support is that they need. And for each person, it's a little different what the scenario is, but it's because they feel like that's their only option because something is missing in their life. There isn't enough support around them. There isn't a network. And so what we wanna do is really amplify the work of the groups that are putting support networks around women that are saying, here, we can come alongside you and provide you financially, emotional support. We can give you the training that you need. Once you have this child, we actually have a, a baby clothes closet that you can come and, and get the supplies you need. There's just so much, and even adoption. For some women that is gonna be their best decision is they just feel like that's not where they are in their life, but they can have this child and meet a beautiful need that another family has that they're dying for that child. They're, they're, they want a child in their home, but they maybe can't have children. And so there, there's all these pieces that need to come together and we all play a really important role. And I would say never more important than now is it for us to make sure that the needs of women are being met, especially as we're having some success legally around limiting abortion. That's gonna be where women need us more because that's not gonna change the fact that women do find themselves in unplanned pregnancies. And so um, we, we're also actually, one of the things that we're doing right now, which is pretty cool, is we do a 12 city um, clergy uh, event tour. So basically we go into all these cities across Virginia and we meet with pastors and faith leaders. And what we do, part of that message is actually telling them we want you as a church, because we believe as Christians, we believe they should lead the charge on this. We believe that, you know, if you're a person of faith, you read in scripture that it's kind of on, on the body of Christ to minister to others. And so out of our faith tradition, we actually go in and we meet with faith leaders and we tell them, this is your charge as the head of the body of Christ in your area. What are you doing for these women? And um, there's this really great new resource out of something called Susan B. Anthony. It's a good pro-life group. And they put together something called Her Plan. And Her Plan is a very detailed resource guide that churches can use. They can actually do, there's a QR code. They can actually scan a QR code and they can take a self-assessment of all the things they could be doing. Do I support our pregnancy resource center? Do I, have I ever run a diaper drive in my church? Have I ever you know, connected to the local adoption agency? And so they can literally assess their church and how well they're doing at meeting the needs of women. And then they can find out what else they can do to help. And so we're actually kind of putting that in front of these pastors and saying, we got to all come together because life is too sacred. And simply saying abortion is not the answer isn't enough. Absolutely. Victoria, uh, the more you speak, the more I really want to write down. You have so much resources and tools at your disposal. <laughs> I hope all of this are in one, one comprehensive place. Yes. Because small, no, we, okay. So is it on your website? Um, we have not gotten that part on our website yet. So I'm glad you're saying that because that's what we probably need to do is get a direct link to this program that we're putting out in front of pastors. And also, Victoria, you said something that really touched my heart. I mean, we can change all the laws we want, but if you really don't provide the true support that mothers need and you don't change their hearts and minds of why they're right. doing what they're doing, I mean, laws can only get us so many. There are so many legal Absolutely. Ways. People will figure out a way to do get it done, find the loopholes, but I think changing the hearts and minds. And uh, I think I'm so thankful that you're involving the churches and pastors. At the end of the day, they are the ones that can do the change of hearts and minds. It's not legal professionals that can do that. Yes. And we just have to look at it as a both and, right? It's not just that, because when we have a culture that says life is disposable, that's a problem. But if we have a culture that says no abortion, but we don't provide needs, right? They have to go together and we all have to kind of see ourselves as connecting those dots so that people, you know, can can experience the beauty of of sometimes having an unplanned pregnancy. There's so many amazing stories of women that have gotten the resources they needed, chose not to have an abortion, and now they can't say enough wonderful things about that choice that they made. But we've got to put that out there so women see that, you know, a, a lot of times I think the abortion movement actually underestimates women. You know, they're out there making it sound like if you want to have a career or you want to go to college, you better abort this child. Women are bigger than that. We're stronger than that. We're, we can get this done. It's just we need to, you know, bring in the community around us to, to make that possible. So I just don't want women to underestimate themselves um, because motherhood is so beautiful. I'd hate for people to give up on that if it's just a matter of us helping more. Uh, Victoria, you have four, four children and you still <laughs> are running a foundation. 
So if we yeah. all try a bit more, I think we can do. I say yep. I came to the United States when I was 22, had my baby first one at 24, didn't have any parents. Yeah. <laughs> um, we just made it happen as a couple. So yeah. if, where there's a will, there is a way. You want Absolutely. To Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I so wish a lot of women listen to this. I think it's extremely important that people have choices. People actually at least consider this as a choice. Take the support yeah. you need. So uh, let's talk about the marriage. I mean, I know Family Foundation believes in marriage as a lifelong union between one man and one woman. It's an institution yeah. of God and a foundation for civil society. Uh, abundance of uh, even social sciences uh, shows us that men, women, and children benefit economically, physically, and emotionally when they have a stable two-parent marriage and family. That's like a well-documented research everywhere. So how is Family Foundation promoting and defending this traditional marriage unit as a foundation for stable society, if not for anything, even for economical wise and for the kids' sake? How are you guys promoting that? Yeah, there has just been this kind of tragic change in viewpoints in our society where we've gone from really focusing on what kids need and what kids deserve to the desires and wishes of adults. And so we've we've sort of in our laws and in our concepts separated the idea that, that we want to put kids first. And we know, as you pointed out, the best outcomes for kids are when they have their mom and their dad together in a lifelong commitment. Now, we're, we know abuse, there's lots of reasons why that doesn't always happen. And we would never wanna pr promote something unhealthy. That's not the kind of the point, but um, there's a difference between when that happens and as a society saying, Eh, marriage could come or go, doesn't really matter, doesn't really hurt the kid, you know, it doesn't matter if you ever make the commitment together, it doesn't matter, you know, this is, this is an unfortunate view that we've taken that is really having a harmful effect because the social science hasn't changed. If you look at the prison populations, you look at, I mean, by any indicator, fatherlessness, not having your biological dad in your home connected and telling that, that firm foundation of supporting your mom, all of that builds a child's self-esteem and their own value in themselves. And it just sets them up for so much success in life. And we've just kind of lost all that. And, and so the Family Foundation, we just, don't, we just don't feel like we need to change just because society has kind of ditched the idea that kids are the first point. Um, we really feel like the, the point is adults should be doing what's best for kids. And so we don't want marriage to be easier to break than your cell phone contract. So we've, we've put a lot of effort into trying to reform um, divorce laws. There's a lot of folks that experience what we call unilateral divorce. Someone just abandons the marriage. Um, and that is devastating for the woman usually and for the child. Um, and so we just wanna make sure that we take as seriously our marriages as we do these other contracts that we create, um, especially because human beings are involved. Um, and then of course, there is the issue of the definition of marriage. We still believe a <laughs> marriage should be a man and a woman because that is what's best for children. That is what God designed. Um, and obviously the courts say otherwise at this point. Virginia passed a marriage amendment years and years ago. The Supreme Court has overridden that and that's just the reality of it. But now what we see is we've separated the idea of being able to have children from marriage, that the idea that those two things are connected and by doing that, we end up with really tough situations that we try to battle in the legislature. So for example, Virginia has um, very terrible surrogacy laws, for example. So in Virginia, kind of any two people can contract with any other persons to kind of create a human life and then put it into any womb. Um, it's just not the way God designed it. And that child that is the product of, we picked a sperm and an egg, put it together, put it in somebody's, that is really, really a tough way to go through life where you have no medical history, you don't feel like you are the product of love and that you're being raised by the people who it just, um, so we just find these challenges and they show up in the legislature. Um, and our job is just simply to continue to remind adults that these things have impact on children. They really, really do. And so we're just kind of constantly working through that. Um, one of the things that we battled this year um, is that as I mentioned, since the courts have sort of said that our marriage statement in our constitution, in Virginia's constitution is invalid, they've kind of said it doesn't really matter that we have that, we knew that folks would want to repeal that and replace it with something else. Um, and we were prepared for that. I think we were surprised that what they wanted to replace it with was actually not simply a definition that said, okay, we're going to allow same-sex marriage. 
It actually was language that said Virginia would honor and consider equal and respect all marriages between any parties. And the problem with that is it didn't even limit it to two people. And I know that sounds extreme, except polygamous relationships, polyamorous relationships are actually trending up. Uh, people are actually doing much more unconventional things in their, in their relationships. Um, the last thing Virginia needs to do is then open the door wider to say, we can have unusual um, scenarios where we have more than two parties trying to enter a marriage. Um, so we were a little shocked at the language that came before our General Assembly. And that's an example of where the Family Foundation stepped in and said, um, I think you're going further than we're even expecting that you would go. And we did block that language. So they'll have to go back to the drawing board on what they would try to put back into our Virginia Constitution because we felt like, boy, I mean, what a worse way to undermine children than to get into um, a constitutional statement at our you know, highest level of law, um, something that would allow marriage with more than two parties. Victoria, this seems to be like an everyday fight for you. You always have to be so watchful to see what are they going to do to screw up uh, our traditional uh, values, right? And it's I think unfortunate. It is, it is. I mean, this is like a nightmare. So Victoria, I do, I, I have a very good friend who is a family counselor. So while you were talking, I was remembering her words. I said, so what do you think we'll do, we can do to get to, to ensure that our kids have the stable mental, physical well-being? Uh, the, uh, I think my friend said, don't worry about the kids. They'll be fine as long as your marriage is stable. As long as you come across as a stable human being and have a stable life, they will be fine. It's I kind of amazing how true that is. They, they pick up on what we put down. And um, when they know they have a mom and a dad that are sticking it out, that are in it for the long haul, they can overcome a lot. Yeah, but I think uh, you were also very realistic, which I really enjoy because coming from the background that I come from, sure. I see a lot of domestic abuse. I mean, I do yes. see that in the healthcare yes. future, sector too, where I see patients. But I think you're being very realistic in saying that, hey, we understand there are circumstances where you, you don't want to stay in an unhealthy relationship, but we're just talking about not forcing yourself to get into unhealthy relationships or not breaking a contract like you would, you would break a cell phone contract. Yeah, well, I mean, there are single moms that are superheroes everywhere. We all know them. They are amazing. Most of them would tell you it is that much harder because they don't have a spouse. It's not that they wish that situation on themselves. They're just, that's what they're in and they're making it awesome. Um, but that doesn't mean we don't want the best. And so what we're trying to do as a society is not intentionally create homes that don't have a mom or don't have a dad. That's kind of what we're talking about is what do we, what do we want to hold up as the ideal? We know it won't always happen. And we want to love and support when it doesn't happen. But how do we encourage that which is the best? Because ultimately the health of our kids is the health of our Commonwealth and our country. If our kids you know, struggle with mental health, if our kids struggle and get into trouble, we pay for that as a society. We pay for it financially, we pay for it emotionally. The toll that it takes in our lives when there are just brokenness around us, it's so hard. And so we're just saying, let's all aim for that which is best, that social science says over and over and over again is the best, and then we'll go from there. Absolutely. So while we're talking about parents, Victoria, I'm sure you're observing what is happening in Fairfax and Loudoun County. Government bureaucrats have worked from the perspective that parents are the problem and government is the solution. In fact, when um, uh, Terry McAuliffe said that parents' voice don't matter, I was right there in the debate. Uh, <laughs> and I literally said, uh, it, it just, I gasped. You knew. Oh God, because that is the last thing I would have expected. Yeah. Let's talk about from education to healthcare decisions involving mm -hmm. the kids. Parents are often at the mercy of the government right now. Should I mask my child or should I not mask my child? And and this attitude from the government is only getting worse by the day. We thought that Yankin would come in and solve all the issues. We know that's not possible. We can just take a wand and move. But has the Family Foundation proposed any laws regarding parental involvement and decision and also stand up for families like us in, in this yeah. country? Yeah, so our organization was actually founded on parental rights issues. This is the funny thing. We've been around 36 years. So just to tell you, this is not a new issue. Our founder, the reason we were created was actually because he didn't like what was being taught in Fairfax County Public Schools in the, what we call sex ed, but it's family life education is the official name in Virginia. But he didn't like what was being taught and he started speaking out. And then he'd find that there were more parents. And what he ended up doing is really proposing this idea that shouldn't this 
idea of sex ed, whatever we're gonna teach in family life education, shouldn't that be an opt-in program rather than an opt-out program? Meaning, isn't it the first job of the family? And if the family wants to delegate that to the public school, they can, but it shouldn't be assumed that the public school does it unless the parent proactively knows all the details and pulls their kid out, right? It's reversed in it from what the natural order ought to be. And so that's actually how we started. And so that's been a key issue Parental rights has been sort of a, a staple issue for the entire history of the organization. And so um, some of the things that are, are, are exciting is that um, one of the most important laws that we're all talking about and relying on now, we were really instrumental in helping pass. And that's the, the parental rights statute that's actually in our code that says that parents have a fundamental right to you know, decide their children's lives. And it talks about education specifically. Um, but the, the point is we put that in the code because we knew that there was a mentality that we've now seen and uh, Terry McAuliffe and others where it's sort of the parent is the bad guy, the government is the savior. We were seeing it, I have seen it every legislative session that I have been down at the legislature, which I guess is like 21 years or something like that now, where every time you get into these discussions over what's happening in a public school, you always see the education cartel or whatever you want to call it, all the school board associations, the superintendent associations, the um, VEA, you see all those groups come in and you see them argue about how they know best and parents don't. And I, I know that this happens because sometimes there are the worst case examples. Sometimes there are examples that they have where a parent wasn't the best case scenario, but that is not 90 plus percent of the situations, but they have that, that bad example and they make it sound like that's the norm. And so they wanna push out the parent and it is shocking. In fact, you'd think after the election, they would have learned. I mean, we just saw this play out, huge issue in the election, Republicans won. So the voters basically said, we're with you, Governor Yunkin, on this idea that parents know best and we're not with you, Terry McAuliffe. And yet even in this general assembly session, we again heard this repeated. We had um, Delegate Lopez actually said on the floor as he's uh, we were debating this bill about sexual explicit content and parents having an alternate, you know, that they should be notified if somebody's going to put sexually explicit content in your kid's school, they should be notified and you should have an alternate option if you don't think your kid's ready for whatever that assignment is. And they're discussing this. And he actually says that, that we shouldn't bow to, quote, the lowest common denominator and the loudest voices basically. And then he goes on to say how great educators, how they know best and whatever. So we're still, even after the election, that mentality is still there. We still see that both uh, left wing legislators and these education establishment groups keep on sort of digging in that they are right and parents are wrong. And I think at the end of the day, it's going to cost those legislators votes and elections. And because I don't think this is going away. We haven't solved half of the issues parents have. Um, we were able to get that particular bill through the General Assembly. So um, as soon as Governor Yunkin signs it, we will actually next school year have the situation where parents will be able to have an alternate curriculum. But we still have sex ed with all sorts of stuff in that family life education that parents don't like. They still want a better system. They still want to be able to make it opt in. We still have so many different things that we've tried to move forward that were parental rights issues that still died in the hands of these legislators because we still have a liberal Senate. We still have a left-wing Senate. And so it's a long way to go, um, but we're gonna keep sticking up for parental rights. We think parents know best in 90 plus percent of the cases and we'll deal with those, those rare occasions where a parent you know, makes a mistake, it doesn't have the best interest of their child. That's, that's what you have you know, CPS for when there's really a problem. But, Parents generally know their children the best and they absolutely know what they're ready for and what they're reading and writing and what's going on in school. They, they know what kind of conversation should be happening, what kind of material should be in front of them. And we should, you know, give them that respect. Absolutely, Victoria. I mean, who, who wants best for their child other than the parents, first and foremost, right? Absolutely. And Victoria Vincent was on our show last Monday, and she spoke about this issue. And she said, if all the candidates that are going to be running in 2022, 2023, just focus on parental rights, they'll win. Right? Oh, 100%. I believe her. 
And I think you're absolutely, and I think one more thing that she tagged along and kind of inspired all of us to do is be involved. I think if parents continue to stay involved and continue to say that this is not okay, hopefully at certain point, somebody like Delegate Lopez will realize. I just don't think they're there yet, but hopefully in 10 years, they'll get there. But it's they'll interesting to say that fa Family Foundation actually started in yeah. County with parental rights. Yeah, That's and it was just a dad. It was just a dad that said, I, I don't like what's going on and I'm going to find a way to mobilize people around it and that 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 issue is as old as, <laughs> as this organization and it just kind of rears its head in different formats you know whether it's the books in the library or the curriculum or we had a bill this this year that was actually just simply saying parents ought to be notified if kids are getting counseling on sexual matters from the school counselor um, you know parents need to be able to speak fruit into the lives of their children to speak you know um, in in the way that that they can best help kids. To think that kids could be showing up at school, for example, and I, I think about this, you know, sharing with a counselor that they're suicidal. And that counselor doesn't think, now there can be a rare case where a parent is the abuser and that needs to come out. But if that is not what's coming out, who best to help that child in every way? The parent knows more about what's going on in that child's life than some guidance counselor, you know, but, but we're still not inviting parents into all of those conversations. And these are, in some cases, really, really important matters that are mental health and, and really, I mean, life and death kind of issues. And parents need to be the driver. They need to be the one given the authority and the knowledge um, you know, we joked about this on our radio show, but it's actually tragic. You know, there's California actually has um, a program in some of its schools called a transition uh, closet. And this is literally a, a place where kids can come into the school and change out of their clothes to change their gender. Because if their parents don't approve or whatever, then they can be a whole different person within the building. Do you know what that kid's life is going to be like? That doesn't that doesn't solve the problem. That exacerbates and it puts it literally creates a wall between that child and that parent who are working through tough issues in that moment. But the school is is kind of going, we're going to jump in and kind of pretend that the kid is is, you know, totally able to make all the best decisions for themselves and the parent is totally wrong. No, we got to partner. We got to partner through these hard things. Absolutely, Victoria. Every single day, I feel I say this at work too, jokingly. Every single day, I learn something new in the United States. I mean, this yes. transition closet is a new yes. thing. I had never. Yes. Heard. Well, I hopefully, it doesn't come to Virginia. <laughs> No, I, I hope not. I'm knocking the wood. Uh, so at 26 or 27, when my son started going to school and the first time I heard about sex ed, it was a culture shock to me. I'm like, excuse me. They're like, yeah, uh, you just have to, I mean, your kids go through that. And I didn't know about the option of opt, opt out. Mm -hmm. was Most option parents option. don't. Yeah. So it's just, a, it was a complete culture shock. I think I kind of adapted well now, I understand. But that was just a culture shock to me, I must admit. Yeah, and we're kind of past just sort of basic biology stuff. We're really in schools talking about some sensitive matters where family beliefs and traditions and all of that and a child's maturity, it all comes into play. And the idea, you know, having had four kids, you sort of know that each kid hits a chronological age, but that doesn't mean it's the exact maturity that your previous kid at that age had, you know? I mean, uh, you know, we, we in our house, for example, you know, when you, you get a cell phone after you've achieved a certain amount of maturity, and that is not a chronological age. They all want it to be like, oh, if I hit 14, I get a, no, actually you have to prove to us. And one kid was ready long before the next kid. That is what a parent understands that putting an age or a grade level on material that you're going to teach to everyone just doesn't uh, doesn't take into account. And so, yeah, we we think these are sensitive matters that parents ought to handle them. We encourage parents have these conversations. The government wouldn't feel they need to step in if parents were really having open, honest, good discussions with their kids. Um, sometimes that, that's a hard thing, and we hope parents feel equipped. And I think there's lots of great resources. Like Family uh, Focus on the Family has lots of great resources on how to talk to your kids about these tough things because we do have to do our job. We can't abdicate it to the government.
Absolutely. And I, that, I think it boils down to parents taking accountability of their own children. Mm -hmm. And um, I think my pet peeve is every time I go to school board meetings, I usually say, can you please focus on teaching my son, my kid English, math and science? Yes. I mean, do not worry about others. I said, I'm fully capable of educating. I balance my child how much they need to know. Social, I mean, those are all very important. Trust me, I believe yes. in all of those. But at the end of the day, I send my kid to school to focus on English, math, and science. Can well, you isn't it crazy that the school boards were so focused on these issues like transgender guidelines and all these book issues? They were so hung up on all these things, right? As we were getting the results of our kids have been out of school for a year, they are failing. I mean, we were down double digits across Virginia in reading, math. Um, what was the third one? There's three. So I guess it would be science. I, there were three main indicators, and we were double digits down in our pass rate. Yep of these. And, and instead of the school boards going, we got to double down on these core principles, these core subjects, they were talking about what we're doing on the side. And that's tragic because I so think if schools gonna... had time and energy to focus on the important things, we wouldn't have a lot of time left over to be battling in school boards about this other stuff. They'd be- That's, that's when you say school board is out of touch. I had a school board member the other day, I met her at breakfast. I was, uh, I, I was at an event uh, and she said, oh boy, our meetings go up until 10, 11 PM. I just jokingly said, I said, the reason is you're not focused on the core components of curriculum. Yeah. I said, really focus on core components of why your role is and not worry about everything else you'll get your job done in the time that you're expected to <laughs> exactly exactly so they feel like they're working very hard in kind of helping us with social justice but i feel like they're distract they're super distracted it's distracted that's yep that's exactly right if we spend a little less time on the distractions a little more time on the core stuff i think and i it's kind of amazing to me that that's not glaring right now when you see the scores and you know these kids are struggling um i, I don't understand how that isn't so obvious to everybody involved in education right now. We need to double down on, on teaching kids to read and write really well. And also, Victoria, I have friends internationally, right? So we kind of compare the curriculum yeah. and so on and so forth. And our curriculum in the United States continues to degrade. And these are the kids down the road in 10, 20, 30 years have to compete globally yes. uh, with Russian mathematics, Chinese math, uh, Chinese STEM courses, and so on and so forth. So we just really have to be very focused on our core components and let yeah. the parents deal with everything else. Everything yeah. else is important, but parents are fully capable. So Victoria, let me ask you about religious freedom. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the separation of church and state message, I think you hit a bit on it uh, when you started off of the media, politician and special interest group like ACLU and the actions yeah. of activist judge, just, we are just talking about that, have whittled away at one of our precious liberties. I mean, the right to practice our faith in public, especially during COVID, it was a full display of what yeah. government can do. Is the Family Foundation working on reestablishing Virginia as a model for religious liberty by increasing the legal protection for public display of faith? Especially, I'm a Hindu American, so yeah. I get concerned when churches close down. Yes. Next is temples because we are a minority faith religion. So if majority faith religions um, uh, places are closing down, we are, I mean, <laughs> yeah. shut us down any minute. So what are yeah. you guys doing to help us out there? Yeah, you are absolutely right. You know, Virginia is the, I mean, we were the birthplace of religious freedom. Thomas Jefferson's Statue for Religious Freedom was founded here. And it's the model for not just America, but for the Western world on how we as people of faith, all faiths are expected to participate in our society with our faith, that we aren't expected to um, go into you know, our place of worship for one day and come out and all have to act the same and look the same and never reference the fact that we are people of faith. And so um, it's what's been tragic is that we've had, when, especially under the couple of years of full left-wing reign from governor down to House and Senate, we really had trampling of religious freedom in our laws. And we started seeing for the first time people losing their jobs, maybe not for the first time, but for, for in, in, in large numbers, people starting to lose their jobs 
because their faith said, this is the way I need to be. And the government said, we don't care. <laughs> we don't care, we disagree. And um, in particular, the Virginia Values Act was a big one um, for any faith that has issues around marriage and sexuality. It basically said, you can't enforce those within even a religious organization. So even a church or another kind of faith institution that has a belief about marriage between a man and a woman, maybe sex within marriage only, any of those beliefs, they, they were not allowed to kind of hold their employees to living a life consistent with the tenants that they hold. So if they had an employee, and I think of like, we have a lot of uh, Christian or Catholic schools around Virginia. And I think of those in particular, because those are the ones I kind of know. And it's, it's literally, you could have a teacher that, that teaches a Bible class and says, this is what we believe, but their entire life is opposite. And the kids all know it. And you couldn't, you couldn't do anything about that because that would be under Virginia's new Virginia Values Act, that would have been considered discrimination. Well, really what you're saying is we just want to discriminate against anybody that doesn't line up with all of our principles. We just want people to not just speak them with our words, but live them with their lives. But that is technically illegal in Virginia. And so that became a huge problem. Um, we did have one big success on this this year, and I'm super excited about it. Um, it did come from Delegate Shin, a new delegate, um, who is the Democrat, but brought forward a bill on religious freedom. And um, it was actually, it was basically trying to define that the outward expression of someone's religion can't be discriminated against. Well, this is a big deal for anybody of any religion. Um, some religions are more outwardly expressive than others. Some have headpieces, some have different, you know, there are, it depends on what your faith is. But um, the example I thought of that I knew that was in court right now was we had a realtor in Virginia and they chose to put on their website and I guess on their business card something about Jesus loves you or a Bible verse. And that might not be everybody's faith, but that is her faith. And she should be welcome to do that. And you could choose not to use her if, if, if you know, if you're not a person of that faith and you find that offensive somehow. But the realtor board actually sanctioned her for wow. that. And we would argue that's her outward expression of her religion. And she basically was losing her job. So she was in court defending her right to be a realtor. And so that's an exact example of where I believe that new law, assuming that Governor Youngkin signs it, it's gotten through the House and the Senate, so we're still waiting for signature, would protect outward displays of anyone's religion, of any type of religion. And I think that is incredibly important. I joke about it because it's nice that the General Assembly is finally catching up with the First Amendment. I mean, there's no reason we should have to pass these specific laws because the First Amendment is pretty clear. It's about the exercise of religion. Exercise is not a stationary closed word. That is, we are people of faith that do things that are faith-ish kinds of things. Um, and so, um, you know, that's that's a big deal. Now, I will say we were devastated on what we didn't get through the General Assembly this year. So speaking of pandemic and, and all of that and churches closing down and, and temples and all of that, um, we tried to pass a bill that was called the Essential Worship Bill. Delegate Wren, another new delegate, a Republican, brought forward a bill that simply said the governor can't shut down places of faith when there's a pandemic. You can't just, you, you can't, it's, um, you know, uh, I had a Catholic priest say it this way. He said, you know, our daily bread is as essential as going to the grocery store, you know? So for people of faith, it is a very serious thing to say you can't have access to your minister or your priest or your whoever, that you can't come together and worship the way you um, are, are programmed to do according to you, whatever your tradition is. And um, I tried to use this example when we would talk about it. I actually got an awesome opportunity to meet um, what is the second fastest growing church in the entire world? It's a guy that runs a church in India. And do you know what they did during the pandemic? They were not shut down. Now, so he has this massive like stadium like church. Wow. I mean, it's it's gigantic and it, it seats like, I mean, it's like 8,000 five times, a, five services on a Sunday. So it's an incredible, I think it's like 35,000 people or something like that go to this service on Sundays are connected and consider themselves members of this church. Long story short, because it wasn't shut down, like our government shut down our churches, they turned that into a hospital, literally turned it into a hospital where they got their medical personnel and they were treating patients that couldn't afford the hospitals or couldn't get to the hospitals or they wouldn't take them. And they actually also, it's a very interesting story. The minister said he felt called to store food right before the pandemic hit. So wow. he bought, he bought insane amounts of food and literally their church served 50,000 families 
the equivalent of three meals a day for 30 or 45 days. And so they had these massive boxes of rice and I don't know what else was in there that would go out to these families during COVID. That's what faith communities want to do when there's an emergency. That is, that is why we're faith communities. We're called to serve. Uh, and when you shut down a faith community, you miss that beautiful stuff that could happen. And so we had this awesome bill. It went through the house and we actually got killed in Senate. And so we still have a ton of people that think the government should be able to shut down houses of worship during a pandemic. And that's, that's a major problem. So that should be, Victoria, you explained it so very well. That should be an eye opener for all these priests, right? Uh, so, yes. uh, I mean, I can talk about the Hindu community. So every time I go to the temple and I try to help them understand why voter registration is important, why supporting, not exactly endorsing any candidates, but why giving candidates yes. a platform is important, they always bring up the issue of separating the church and the state. But I said, but these are the issues that matter to our community. Yes. I know there is a document that says that we can do certain things but we are able to do a whole lot of things yes hopefully after this COVID period um, the priests and all realize uh, the religious leaders and the community leaders realize that they just can't use that as an excuse to shut down on the most important topics that really really matter to people and just yes be progressive in that aspect and start talking about it and make yes it <laughs> and I think the other thing that we could do better that family foundation should have done better is we need to connect better across different faith traditions so that when we go to committee to argue for these bills, it doesn't look like just one faith tradition is coming looking for religious freedom because it can be mistaken as we just want this bill for the Christians, but that's not true. But if you only have testimony from one type of, of religion, it, it doesn't it doesn't come across as well as it should. So what we all have to do is figure out how do we connect better so that when we present a religious freedom bill, it's you know, people from the Jewish community, people from the Hindu community, community, people from the Muslim community. How do we, because we, it benefits all of us. It is for all of us. But yet sometimes the bill comes from one direction or another and it, it causes a legislator to kind of think that it's more about a theocracy of some type than just freedom for all. So that's, you know, that's a way that we all can just kind of get better at partnering um, wherever we have you know, someone within our own faith community willing to step forward, we need to connect them with people of other faith communities in those moments. Absolutely, Victoria, that was going to be my another question too, saying that why don't we just kind of work together? Yeah. I belong to Interfaith Community Society, and there's been a lot of things that we were able to uh, uh, make a school board and supervisors board realize the issues yes. that are going on by just working together, especially like Hindu, Muslim, Jain communities, Buddhist communities, and Sikh yes. communities, Muslim yes. communities. They're all very active, especially in Northern Virginia area. So, I mean, if you consider working, if you would like to consider yes. being able to network you with uh, faith leaders, and then absolutely, I think that would help a lot. I think that I think I think you know we just. I think for some people, they need to see either their own religion at the table, you know, so I think there are legislators that want to see somebody from their faith at the table to feel like it's more valid. Um, so we kind of need to have representation. So that's exciting. We can, get this, we can get this done. Yeah, I, another one I keep saying is Republicans need to do a good job. I know that they're fighting for religious uh, freedom, period. They're mm -hmm. not fighting for religious freedom from for Christians, but it's right. just very important that they speak out, articulate yes. the message. Yes. Yeah. So Victoria, let's talk about marijuana. I mean, I have kids, so uh, again, yeah. I'm not drug culture at all. That's again, another culture shock to me when mm. I came in 20 years back. Marijuana and again, gambling legislation or re recent issues in Commonwealth. I also read in one of the blog, I believe that Family Foundation took a very firm stance, thank you, in fighting against the expansive policies. How did you do that? And what did the organization do to kind of stop and curb that? Yeah, we've been um, on the marijuana front, we've been fighting this for quite some time, um, you know, it's interesting for years, one person might introduce a bill on marijuana and it would go nowhere. It would hardly even get a hearing. And then all of a sudden the government changes, we get um, Democrat control house Senate governor, and it goes from not even a discussion about medical marijuana or even all the way to, we're going to overnight make it legal. And we're going to right after that, make it commercialized. And so we have been really bringing together folks from the medical community, mostly trying to say, look, this is harmful. This is not, uh, and honestly, a lot of people don't realize that marijuana has really increased uh, the THC, the, the high potent 
THC levels in marijuana now. So it's not even for some people, they don't even realize it's not even the marijuana that they smoked when they were in college 30 years ago. A lot of times we're talking about something much more dangerous. Um, so we've been trying to really bring together a medical coalition. Um, but last year when, when the General Assembly was um, controlled by Democrats and they wanted to pass this, they didn't hear from the health experts at all. They made the entire hearing about money and justice and they would not discuss is there a downside? Is there is there concern on health? And so it was impossible to stop that train because that's really where the rubber meets the road. So this year, when the Republicans took over the House, they actually created the opportunity for a hearing where you could actually put forward the medical information. Because again, the decision about, are we going to have a pot shop on every corner? That was this year's decision. And when you put forward the compelling testimony, there was, I mean, I was amazed. People changed their minds. Um, I mean, you people just didn't know. People haven't heard. People don't really realize how harmful it can be because I think that, you know, people do know it that use it for recreation. It hasn't ruined their whole lives, but they don't always hear the tragic stories or the gateway stories or even just the brain effect or in particular, the, I think the really compelling testimony is the doctors that talk about pregnant women who smoke marijuana, the harm to the unborn baby is unbelievable. And I, I didn't even know how significant it was. But when you legalize something, people stop realizing it's a threat. And so we are gonna see, Colorado is ahead of us on this curve and many other places, we're gonna see the reality of pregnant women don't realize how bad it is for them. And so, because it's legal, you know, if it's legal, it must be fine. No, that's not true. It's terribly harmful for your unborn child. And so when you put that testimony forward, they start really reevaluating. And so they actually this year said, we're not gonna commercialize it right now. We're not ready. We don't know enough. And they actually held it off. And I, we had a wonderful coalition of groups the Family Foundation actually had lots of groups that were helping and actually leading on this. So we didn't stand alone. Some of our issues were kind of, you know, out on an island, but on this one, there's just a lot of folks that have seen, you know, you can look at the safety reports out of states like Colorado and just the uh, intoxicated driving from, you know, being under the influence of, of, of marijuana and just the devastation that it's taking. So it's just presenting the facts is really the main, the main thing. And we hope that this gave them enough pause to regroup and really think about, is this still the direction we want to go as a commonwealth? I always say if somebody undermines the influence of marijuana, especially if you're a pregnant woman, mm -hmm. I say uh, go to any hospital, nick your neonatal intensive mm -hmm. care and stay there for two hours. You'll never touch drugs after that. Yeah. Right. So yeah. I actually babysat for a, uh, a family that had a foster child and it was a drug addicted baby. And I will tell you, that was the hardest job I ever had because a drug addicted baby cannot settle itself. It can't, it just doesn't have the ability to calm down. And so that, I mean, boy, you're absolutely right. Just, just see the impact on a, on a young child. It's devastating. So Victoria, all the things that you're talking about, I mean, these are the values that immigrants and minority communities embrace, right? But mm -hmm. so what, what is Family Foundation doing anything different in these communities? Uh, I'm not talking about general education, but anything different in these communities to help them understand that, hey guys, we're all the same. We talk about the same thing. Our values are all the same. How can we work together? So is there an effort to kind of um, get them aligned with your principles? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I think the family issues are such a tying bind between all different races. I really do. I believe that our cultures, many of them, those issues of family and life and um, parents are actually central. And actually, I think in some ways that puts us in a great place to have these conversations in minority com communities, even better sometimes in the Republican Party, um, because they have a lot of issues our issues happen to be ones that really do overlap with the passions of a lot of the minority communities. And so it's been really great because we actually come in, we don't have a, a partisan label, although we tend to need Republicans to get our legislation across, but we don't have a partisan label. So sometimes that can be a barrier because people have grown up in a family that might be generations of Democrats. Um, but because we can come in and say, but we agree on these issues. Um, and we aren't necessarily ourselves a partisan organization. It gives us a little bit more of an entree to say, hey, we line up on these things. Let's get them done together, um, which is really awesome. We need to do a better job. We every day, it's how can we 
do a better job um, reaching into minority communities. Um, it's been kind of cool. Our building actually is very large and we actually didn't need all of the space. And so one of the things that we did was we actually were able to um, give some space to a group called the Black Society for Economic and Social Transformation. And really what that was, was a minority group trying to really bring our issues into the minority community. And so it allowed us to kind of learn a little bit about how they were approaching it um, and how to, because I mean, what better than a family foundation that's actually the same issues carried by the minority culture themselves. It was just very cool. Um, and so we, we now had to take over that space in this last little month or two. And so they're now in a different space, but it, it's been a good learning experience just to kind of help try to birth a group that really even carries this message better than we do. Um, the other thing that we try to do, we don't do enough of it, is translating more of our materials, our voter guides, we try to get into multiple languages. So this year, this past year, if you had gone to our site looking for voter information, you could literally just click what language you needed and the guide would flip to your language. I think that's so important, um, particularly when we talk about voting because our guides, as you know, they just kind of lay out these family issues so they're great for the Hispanic community to look at and go, hey, but we need to have them in Spanish because that's somebody's first language, you know? And so same thing with Korean. We have so many amazing Korean churches um, that we can actually connect with during elections. They believe so many of the same ideas, but it's helpful to have a resource actually in, in their language. So we're working on all that stuff. We don't have all, I mean, a lot of our stuff is not yet in other languages, but I do think that's important. I think that's part of, just becoming an organization that meets the needs of all different kinds of folks. Um, but I do think our issues alone are awesome issues to connect to the minority community. We don't happen to do some of the ones that might be a little more controversial. We actually aren't an organization that gets involved in immigration issues. That's just beyond our scope of issues. So sure. some of the issues where there might be some minorities that separate from the Republican Party don't happen to be our issues. That also helps us you know, kind of not have certain walls. Now, a lot of the folks that are in minority cultures that I know of actually support, you know, legitimate borders and coming through, you know, some of the, you know, probably the position that we might take on some of those issues anyway, but we don't take a position. So it just allows a little bit more conversation. Um, Victoria, if I may suggest, I also suggest that your uh, any website can also be replicated in different languages. Yeah, I think we need well, to probably get there. Yeah, I, I know as an evolving organization, we all have pressing competing priorities, right? <laughs> I work on an organization, there's only so much you can do. That, yeah. but, but I think that will play such a major role because you can only get uh, so many volunteers to door knock and give the water guides yeah. to so many people. If yeah. it is, however, if your website is accessible and is in different languages, I mean, people can kind of make use of that anywhere they are in. Yeah, we are excited. We have um, this summer, one of our interns that will be doing a ton of door knocking is fluent in some other languages. So that's exciting because we'll be in areas like Prince William and other areas where there's a lot of languages spoken across Virginia. And, you know, we don't want to be limited by the fact that we have too many just English only kinds of speakers. So that's, you know, th those are the kind of things that are just little baby steps, but we need to, you know, I love the idea of getting the whole website. We put so much content out constantly yeah. that we would have to be sort of a, the toggle switch idea because every blog every day I don't know how we'd have somebody that could translate it all the time but if you could literally you know do the toggle switch thing which I think you can't I think there are programs out there yeah, that are um, okay so so yeah I think that's a great idea so uh, Victoria I know we are coming to the end of the program and I want to make sure I'm very respectful of your time since you talked you talked about Prince William one of my pet peeves is you guys do such an amazing job in Richmond. You had a round table. I came to Richmond to talk to other uh, group leaders, especially the minority community leaders. That's when I just heard so much about you and uh, you, I, I enjoy your vision very much. I so wish you'll have some other strategy plan for Nova, where Prince William is a diverse county. Fairfax yeah. AOP is the largest unit. There's so much going on in Loudoun County and it's expanding with immigrants and minority communities. I hope you, you will have energy. I'm not where else you'll find them. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll be interesting. You know, we do now have one staff member who is permanently based, you know, he lives in uh, Nova and is trying to connect more with everything that's going on up there. So that's been a step forward for us to not have all Richmond based folks. So that's one piece. The other thing is we are working a lot in the seventh congressional district this year. And so that will put us, you know, sort of Caroline to Prince William, I guess that's as far as it goes, but at least you know, we'll be up there a little bit more with that particular uh, congressional race this year. 
I think that would uh, that would really make a huge difference. I think if you're looking at Virginia, I think this is where you guys need to be doing your magic. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Victoria, I know you're a very busy lady I, and you're very well respected, extremely articulate. I've call, I kind of followed you for years at this point. <laughs> I thank you for spending your valuable time with us. I know our viewers appreciate this. I'll be sharing this video in all kinds of platforms because it's very important people hear the family foundation work and the great work that you are doing. We appreciate you and value your work. Thank you for coming to Conversations That Count. Thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed my time here. I appreciate that. So uh, viewers with primaries coming up in May, I am committed to introducing as many congressional district candidates as I can to ensure that you make an informed choice of who your candidate should be. That being said, next Friday, April 1st, I'll have Matthew Chappell. He's running for 11th congressional district. He will be coming on conversations that count. I hope you all will tune in as he speaks about the issues facing 11th congressional district. Um, another announcement is Senator Tom Cotton will be coming to Fairfax GOP fundraiser on Tuesday, April 5th. If you would like to attend and support Fairfax GOP, please join, get into the Fairfax GOP website and register yourself to attend this great unit. Thank you again to, for your ongoing support to Conversations That Count. Please share this video. Victoria spoke very uh, articulated her the issues very well. Each and everybody that is listening needs to share this video for and why so our values are reflected in the entire Commonwealth and in this great nation. Have a great evening. I'll see you all next week. God bless you all. God bless America. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you.